Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, there's quite a few things that have already resonated this morning um, that will probably pop up again in my talk. Uh, what I thought would be a good starting point for our discussion, I really just uh, want this to be a starting point for our discussion uh, today, is to throw up some ideas to show you some of the things that have been done in other parts of the world um, using this idea of the garden as art. And I'll have to say I'm a reluctant convert. Um, I am, um, as the Lord Mayor mentioned earlier, also on the city's public art panel. And sometimes we sit there thinking, okay, what is the public art solution to invigorating this space? How can we utilize artists to come up with good ideas? And really the answer is put a garden in. And so, you know, this idea of is a garden art, um, can art be a garden? I'm unresolved about that, and I think actually one of the challenges, and maybe we can discuss that in the discuss, uh, later today, is to how do we break down that, for me anyway, mental barrier between art and garden and, and make it one thing. And one way is to get artists involved, obviously, but also uh, curators, I think, have a role there to, um, to, to just go get artists to come up with solutions that involve planting. So today I'm going to um, look at some uh, initiatives uh, by artists, some sort of key initiatives, but then I'm also going to look at one's initiatives by curators to involve artists. So the first slide um, is, oh, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of um, reminder of a, a project we did last year at the Sydney Opera House, um, me, the National Institute for Experimental Arts, I'm talking about we, not me, um, where we invited people from different parts of the world to come and talk about how we might uh, use public art to um, not just reinvigorate um, the city but also uh, promote kind of green, green solutions to cultural, to areas sort of in need of a cultural renaissance. Uh, and here we are at the Hot House and we brought Michaela Crimen in uh, from London, who's probably um, the world's leading eco-curator, if there is such a thing. I don't think she uses that term herself, but does a lot of work with artists working in the, in the land and at the landscape. Now, Michaela, um, in turn, used, talked about Joseph Boyce's 7,000 Oaks, which is a work you probably all know. And I, I put this in... Uh, so to make the point that it is still a seminal work, it was done in uh, 1982, and Boyce, uh, it was part of Documenta, the five yearly exhibition in Kassel, Germany. Boyce was invited to participate. He showed up in Kassel with 7,000 stones, basalt stones, they were each about four feet high, dumped them in front of the museum where the exhibition is held, and said, okay, the project is to plant a tree for every one of these stones over the next five years, so up into the next uh, documenta. That project was done, and that's, that's called 7,000 Oaks, and the project has been um, continued in New York by the DIA Art Foundation. Uh, that was 1982 uh, that Boyce did that. Also in 82, Agnes Deans planted her wheat field um, in Manhattan. Now this was um, in Battery Park. It was a landfill site in Lower Manhattan. It took up two acres. She shipped, um, she harvested the wheat, I think there's a thousand pounds of wheat, quite a lot, over, just over the one season, shipped it to 28 countries. So it was making a point how disused space can actually feed people um, in New York and other parts of the world. Again, a really seminal work, happened to be the same year as Boyce's uh, 7,000 Oaks. And Bridget mentioned in her talk this idea about Chinatown not being homogenous, and it just occurred to me something like that, you know, you could sort of feed people, you, you know, ship uh, produce to just to local restaurants. You don't even need to use any freight. I mean, if you took the project that, that much further. This wasn't a one-off work by Deans. It's probably her most famous one, but she did another one where she planted 10,000 trees um, on the mountainside in Finland, again, to um, sort of connect ideas about nature and culture. And I think a lot of these artists, certainly Boyce, felt that he needed to do it to just as a consciousness raising exercise and he saw it necessary and his, his term was in biospheric terms. I mean he was referring to climate change etc but biospheric terms is what he used. Uh, now today um, these projects have been continued by people such as Metabolic Studios. These guys are in LA. They actually came out to our hothouse 
uh, conference last year. That's how we met them. And look, they're helped by the fact that um, the chief artist in their organisation, Lauren Bonn, is an heiress, and so there's there's, there's, there's a good financial sort of source there to, to run these really major projects. Now, this is not unlike the Agnes Dean's work from um, Manhattan in 1982. Only uh, Metabolic Studios uh, took, they used 32 acres of brownfield in the centre of the old part of Los Angeles, the historic centre of LA, 32 acres. So that's like 16 times bigger than the Agnes Dean's um, project. 1,500 truckloads of earth they brought in. Um, it was just an industrial wasteland, not unlike the Dean's um, area. And the aim was to just to, to grow corn. It was they grew corn over one season, uh, but it was really just to make a point that this land is sitting here, not being used. We can do something with it. And in fact, the California Department of Parks and Recreation was so impressed, they have then since taken over the park, turned it into a green space. It's got bicycle tracks, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now it's a really popular destination. So it, sometimes it just takes an artist to put the idea out there, and then the authorities cotton on and do something with it. Another example is the, um, oh, that's, this is the park now. So it started off as a, the cornfield and now it's this amazing park. Um, the High Line in New York, um, I, I, you'd all know that uh, project very well, but it was interesting um, just hearing Xing talk about Liang Sicheng's drawing from 1951. I mean, how sad that Beijing City Wall could have been a, amazing park like the High Line. I've probably got a slightly better image of that. Um, yeah, they're not great. And there's, there's one more, I think, of the High Line. But um, for those of you that don't know about this, this was a um, heavy industrial uh, train line elevated to get those trains out of the Manhattan streets. It was built in the 30s. Uh, it stopped functioning in the 80s. It sat there for nearly 20 years. And in 1999, um, they decided to demolish it. The local community had become quite fond of this structure, even though it wasn't being used for anything. And they got together, and the rest is history. And now it's this fantastic park that people love to go to. And I just Googled it up the other day when I was preparing these slides to see what was happening there. And this Sunday, on the High Line, they're having a um, chef's, chef's dinner. And all the local chefs are coming together and they're uh, serving a, a dinner up on the High Line and you, you buy a ticket to go and you have this incredible feast and then the funds go into looking after the High Line. So it's been a really fantastic sort of community project. Um, another remedial work which you'd all know, the closer to home is Janet Lawrence's um, In the Shadow at uh, Sydney Olympic Park, which Bridget Smythe who was very involved in, in her former role at Olympic Park um, this is, again, another taking a former industrial contaminated space and making something very beautiful from it. And that work, this is a um, work of when it first went in, and this is just a snap I took the other weekend, but those trees are enormous now. And, um, Janet, who actually really wanted to be here today, but she's overseas and she could have talked about it herself, but uh, she said um, it's interesting now. They want to cut down those... Um, Tree, what trees are there, Bridget? Casarina trees. Because they're obscuring the um, bridge and they're obscuring the view of the tennis centre. And so um, Janny's response to the authorities is you can't touch it, it's art. <laughs> Which is one of the pluses, I think, of when you do make, deem a garden as officially as art, then it can't be touched and you can retain some control over it. Um, this, um, I just might move on now to exhibitions, and this, the next one I'm going to talk to um, also features uh, Janet's work. And this is um, a shot of the um, Echigo Samari area in Japan. It's in the Niigata prefecture, um, in, the, in a mountainous area, obviously. And it's an area um, that was a, an agricultural centre and now with um, rice being grown in other parts of the world besides Japan, it has um, declined in, in population and, um, and incomes, etc. And in fact, most of the young people have left there and it's, it's pretty well inhabited by elderly uh, residents. And it, it had a lot of empty homes, empty schools and other buildings 
and um, a man called Fram Kitagawa who, who lived there and loved the area, uh, didn't want to see it fall into this sort of sad, disappearing state, and so he invested a lot of money into what's now become known as the Echigo Samari Triennial. It's, a, it's like a Biennale, it's a tri Triennale exhibition. They've run three, the next one is next year, it started in 2000. And it's, it's a really incredible um, project because of the scale of it. Um, it's actually, it, it, it's, it runs over as an area of 760 square kilometres. So it's a huge area. It takes a long time to see it all. I haven't, but Eva rodriguez Riestra, who's here, has seen it, most of it. Eva went in the summertime. I went in winter, as you can see from my slides, and it's not all open at winter, but if you let them know you're coming, they'll let you into some of the houses. But basically what they do is, um, commission artists from around the world to have one of the little houses, and they're little, they're maybe half the size of this room, and they can do whatever they like with it and it becomes a permanent artwork. And then every third summer when the actual triennial is on, they invite a whole lot more artists to come in and do temporary artworks in the landscape. But it's the permanent ones that are interesting. And Jan Janet Lawrence is one, um, is here. Now look, it was winter and the ground was covered in snow so you can't see the medicinal garden, but she's planted a medicinal garden on the outside of her little house where she grows traditional plants, native plants from that area. And then when you go inside, um, you, you, she or whoever is working there it serves you juices made up from those elixirs. It's called elixir. And then here they are in the jars and they're on the walls. And so again, it's just sort of bringing the outside in and celebrating the, the cultural heritage of the place. And it's a permanent work. Another um, example um, is, this is more when the curators are involved to a large degree, I suppose, is this is the um, Munster Sculpture Project, which happens every 10 years only. Um, in Germany, and the last one, um, Jeremy Della, British artist, uh, who, he, social artist, um, he's known as, did this work, which was basically a garden. In, in fact, he, he didn't really do it. Um, it was more a conceptual work. Where, as he was flying into Munster to check out the space on a site visit, he noticed the, the Klein Gardens, the little garden plots that people have where they grow their own vegetables. And he decided he'd make that his work. So that, that it was kind of like found art, like found object art, found garden art, I suppose. But So his project was to uh, initiate diaries that were kept over the life of a certain period. I think it's till the next sculpture festival. Yeah, it is. So it's from 2007 to 2017. Have diaries kept of who uses the gardens, who tends the gardens, what happens to the food, etc. So again, an almost conscious raising effort um, of um, something that it in, in effect was already happening. So I get, yeah, it just, we might not have known about these little client gardens had it not been for the artist. So in this case, that's where the artist's role was. Um, another garden was, oh, is this one in there, is it? Just flick to the next. Yeah, okay. Um, this, these images are, um, you could go back, are from, um, an exhibition that was at the Barbican Centre a couple of years ago, um, 09, called Radical, Radical Nature. And Michaela Crimmon, who I showed on the very first slide, was one of the curators on that, and she was responsible for organising this work. Now, it's, um, it's just called Dalston Mill, and it's a, commission, um, uh, a commissioned work from Exist, and who's a French architect collective. And, they basically wanted to work with, um, a, again, a disused industrial space. In this case, it's an area near the Olympic development. Uh, and it's a space that, um, you know, is probably now developed, but was in between um, a couple of years ago being developed. I think it had been a car park, something like that. And so they came in and they copied Agnes Dean's idea. They grew wheat. It wasn't such a big space, though. They took it one step further. They uh, put in a, a mill and a cafe, so you could come and harvest the wheat, and you could uh, bake bread, and then you could have, have it with a coffee and invite 
your friends, etc. So it became a community hub just for one summer while the exhibition was on. And there's a couple more slides of that. You can see the cafe there. And it was really popular. That shows you the area where it was. And it's a sort of area where there's a lot of council estates and not, not a great sense of community. So apparently it was so popular that people were pretty upset when it went. Um, it's such an easy thing to do. You can see. And also that exhibition, uh, Radical Nature, um, Fritz Haig, who um, is a New York-based um, ar architect, artist, um, also wanted to work outside. So he actually went to those uh, council estates, which were um, just around the corner, actually, from the uh, Barbican. And um, he, he planted these gardens. He didn't really plant them. He got in the residents of the estates to come out of their flats to actually meet each other, to talk about what they might do with the gardens, what sort of food they wanted to grow, and to put them in. So this, unlike the exist Dalston Mill, is actually a permanent work. It's still there, and it's, you know, it's still a bit of a pretext for bringing people together. Right? It's as much a social work as it is a garden and uh, environmental statement, I think. Uh, similarly, uh, this work by Martha Rossler, which was just this year at the Singapore Biennale, and I'm sorry, my photos aren't great. I went quite early um, when the Singapore Biennale had just opened, and so the garden hadn't grew yet, but on the left, um, this is the area which she, she had started to put a garden in. Now this one, um, you'll notice it's, it's called Proposed Helsinki Garden at the Singapore Biennale. She had proposed this a couple of years ago um, for Helsinki, who had invited her to, to make a project there, and she said she'd like to do a garden. And it never happened um, because they couldn't decide um, in Helsinki. It, I think it was the... Um, the Helsinki Business Campus in Finland had commissioned her, and she's a major international artist, but they couldn't work out if, if it was an artwork or not, or if it was a park, and therefore who would be responsible for looking after it into the future. That could not be resolved, so it didn't happen. Very disappointing for the artist, so when she was invited to be in the Singapore Biennale, she just transferred it over there. And she used, um, she didn't physically plant it herself, she came out to Singapore, she met um, artists, a lot of art students were involved, and the local communities at the old Kalang Airport site, which is a bit of a desolate site, but uh, it's a, there's a lot of residential apartments around there. So they got involved, different groups had different responsibilities, and they planted this amazing garden. And for the Biennale, she had like book plants and other things there, but really it's a garden. There might be a better photo. Um, yeah, look, they're not great photos, but there's a community meeting, and. This is some explanation about what goes in. I'm sure if we go back next year, it's going to look terrific. Again, it'll be a permanent work. Um, this is makeshift at 4A, sort of like Coles to Newcastle showing you that, but um, these guys did a Chinese market garden um, show downstairs last year and where they grew things sort of referring to the cultural heritage of the area, where people, which used to have a lot of market gardens. And one of the highlights for me of that show was they were um, growing things, but also giving away seeds of what they were growing. And I have to say the broad beans did really well in my garden <laughs> uh, from nothing. So uh, that was, a, a, again, a, another sort of a consciousness raising um, project. There's a current um, exhibition on now, Try This at Home. Uh, this, and this is, this is um, a bit of a plug, it is a National Institute for Experimental Arts exhibition. But this work I particularly like, it's called Natural Fuse and they're planter boxes. And they're, um, I don't know how it works, but they're kind of linked um, on a network and you can, you, you take one home, I think you can hire them for $20 or something for the duration of the show. And if you, and they've, they, um, they produce power, so you, what you have, like through, through the leaves. So you have to keep your plant very healthy, and then it, you, if it's very healthy, you'll have enough power to run a small appliance, like a kettle, um, maybe the toaster, a small appliances, kitchen kind of appliances. You can run off this, you plug them straight in. Now, there has to be enough power in the network. There's 50 
planter boxes. So there has to be enough power in the entire network for you to run your appliance. So before you want to turn the kettle on, you've got to get online, see if there's enough power. Now, if there's enough power, that's fine. Um, you just go boil your kettle. If there's not enough power, you have the option to flick the switch to uh, selfish, the selfless and selfish. If you switch it to selfish, you can still boil your kettle, that's fine, but another plant somewhere in the system will get a fatal shot of vinegar. That's the vinegar <laughs> on the outside. So again, another consciousness raising exercise to make us think about where we get our power from and the impact it has down the line. That's at Object Gallery now, that show. Um, now this was also in this year's Singapore Biennale. Um, Tiffany Chung, she's a Vietnamese, young Vietnamese artist. And she uh, grew up on the banks of the Mekong River. And she actually experienced the big 1978 flood, which has given her nightmares forevermore. And when, when the river turned into a sea and houses were uprooted, etc. And this had all, has always haunted her, and so she's, she's come up with this idea that we could just uh, put the whole city on the river and um, had designed this, this beautiful city where, you can, where they're growing gardens and the houses are floating and instead of streets you have water. And it's completely, um, it's a folly, but it's, it's quite a beautiful idea, an alternative way of surviving. The fin finally, um, I just wanted to show you, this is a bit of indulgence, just Follies, really, but this is um, the new Maxi uh, building in, in Rome, the uh, Museum of 21st Century Art. It's a Zaha Hadid building, and they've beautifully integrated the gardens into the landscaping. Um, <laughs> there's all this cement, and then you have these triangles of lawn, it's almost just as a token, but then up the back, um, you have this just kind of a Next, the, the, yeah, rather ordinary kind of flower things happening, but this, the way they've done these um, lawns, they've, where they've sliced in little resting areas, and I, again, I'm, I'm diverting slightly. I just couldn't help showing you my holiday snaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and I'll just show you um, one more, a um, couple more. This is, uh, again, um, the, the sort of how museums can take on using the garden as art, I suppose. Now, obviously, the Zaha he did is in the landscaping of that new museum. This is actually a, a garden-based work that has come inside the museum. And this is me being a curator talking about these, but Dieter Roth, amazing work that he made, um, started in 1968 together with his son. And uh, I was talking to someone earlier about hoarding. This is the sort of ultimate hoarding work. Um, just have a, there's a couple of slides of everything. It's kind of like bringing the garden shed and the garden into the gallery, into the gallery space. But again, it, it, it just making people aware of the kind of activity that happens in a garden and the centrality of a garden to our daily lives and our family lives. And this is Thomas Saraceno, um, whose work you might remember from the 2009 Venice Biennale. He had that big installation, it was like a spider webs that you had to crawl through. Um, this is the, the new um, edition of that, I suppose, that he calls them biospheres. So his, his idea is that uh, we can take the gardens off, they don't have to be land bound, we can suspend them in the air, um, thereby uh, sort of fulfilling our dreams of living in the sky but also of flying because you can enter these biospheres and and they're um they have their own oxygen thanks to the plants growing in there and you crawl around and you feel like you're flying they're really strong this is very utopian um garden work about playing and about dreams and i just want to finish um with a snap of uh rebar the la uh, uh, team who've recently been in australia with their parking day, just for those who aren't aware of this work. This is, a, it's a little work, a uh, little project by an artist that, the artist that has taken off internationally and become, there's now an international parking day, it was 16th of September this year, where the idea is you basically put your money in a parking meter for two hours and if you, but you don't use it to put to um, put your car in there. Bridget was talking earlier about you know claw, clawing back, winning back space from the car in the city. With, this is a really brilliant way to do it. There's one more picture. 
Um, I don't know if there are laws that say if you have if you buy a parking spot for two hours that you have to put a car in it. Interesting question. Um, <laughs> uh, so their, their idea is, well, it's my space, I've put the money in the meter, I'll do what I like. So they run barbecues, picnics, or just have a couch somewhere to read. They usually roll down a bit of lawn. But it's basically for people around the world to do whatever they will with that space for as much time as they can afford to put in the meter. And I think it's just a nice one to end on because it does make us question what our priorities are in the city and in this area of the city particularly where, where people live more than they do in any other part of the city are our priorities to fit the car and to make more car parking spaces or spaces like this where we can sit and chat and eat and drink and you know have a have a community so I'll leave it there thanks Thank you.